Hi, I'm Tom, coming to you from Cleveland, Ohio. Thank you for selecting my video. Today's video marks a major milestone in the sourdough journey. It was five months ago to the day that I published my first video, The Sourdough Journey, Beginner Mistakes and Tips Using the Tartine Method. At that time, I had only baked four loaves of bread using the tartine recipe, and I wanted to capture the essence of what it's like to be a beginner when you're trying to learn how to make sourdough bread. That five-part series is very popular. If you're a new bread baker or beginning bread baker, I suggest watching that series first and then come back and watch this video. And then shortly after publishing that first series of videos, I started a quest to really learn, understand, and share the knowledge about how to bake better and better loaves following the tartine method. I created a number of videos typically using the scientific method where I would hold all the variables constant except for one. I would change one variable and bake a number of loaves. I created videos on overproofing and underproofing, on cold proofing in the refrigerator for up to five days. I created videos on the mystery of bulk fermentation. And I recently completed a three-part series called In Search of the Open Crumb, where I looked at the impact of final shaping, pre-shaping, and bulk fermentation on the open crumb of a sourdough loaf. Which brings me to today. In today's video, we will go back to the beginning. I will revisit the classic tartine bread, basic country loaf, and we're gonna start over again based on everything that I've learned since that time. So over the course of doing these experimental instructional videos, I've baked this recipe probably 20 times. And I would say that I've consistently produced very good above average loaves, but I've rarely produced spectacular loaves. So that's what I really wanna dive back into today is to do a deep dive back into tartine, the basic country loaf, and figure out if we can turn this from pretty good loaves into spectacular loaves. So as I worked on each video, I would pick up one or two more bits of knowledge. Then I went back and I reread the text of this book multiple times. I read the Tartine book three, which revisits this recipe. I watched all the videos from Chad Robertson. I watched interviews. I listened to podcasts to really try to figure out what was happening with the way that I was making these loaves? What was I doing wrong? What could I do to fix it? And I really did a deep dive into the text. And what I realized is that the science only gets you so far. And reading the exact chapter and verse of the text only gets you so far. And what I realized is that there are phrases in the book like, fold the dough gently, turn the dough until it's fully aerated, what do these things mean? I mean, these are subjective terms and this whole process is riddled with these types of terms. So what I realized is that I got to the point in bread baking that you get to with any other art or skill. So I compare this a lot to music. When you learn a musical instrument, you start with the basics and you really learn the mechanics of music. You learn to read notes, you learn to play scales, chords, cadences, arpeggios, but you're really learning the mechanics of the art. Then you apply it to the simple songs, you become familiar with how it works, but you're still not truly creating music. And that's really where we are with this process today. I've been following the steps using science to get me as far as I can get. But today we go to the next level where now we need to do interpretation. This is where you take the sheet music, you give it to three different people and three people will play it completely differently because the creation of music is about expression. It's about dynamics and it's about phrasing. This is what's still missing from the application of the recipe. And that's what we'll look at today is filling in the white space, filling in the blanks, and really trying to understand the art of bread making that sits on top of the foundation of science. And at this point, you're probably saying, who is this guy? I like the old Tom better. I like the sciencey Tom. I like the guy who focused on weights and measures and talked about the history 
of the metric system. What's this guy doing talking about music and art and all these ambiguous terms? I like the old guy. Maybe there has always been more here than meets the eye. So in addition to the art of bread baking, we also need to understand what I call the alchemy of bread baking. So I've taken the science of bread baking as far as I know how to take it. And now when you look at what we're doing when we're baking bread, it's complicated. It involves chemistry. It involves biology. It involves physics. Those are the three primary disciplines that are required to make a loaf. But in addition to that, you need to understand architecture. You need to understand thermodynamics and then sprinkle in a little planar geometry and mathematics to round it out. This is a complex process. So when you get as far as you can get with the science, now we're into multivariate analysis where we're changing multiple variables at the same time and doing small changes. My schooling didn't go that far. Contrary to popular belief, I'm not a rocket scientist. So when it gets to multivariate analysis, this is what I call alchemy. We're gonna change multiple variables at the same time. We're gonna use intuition to try to assess what's going on. And we're going to try to change lead into gold like the medieval alchemists. When I created this YouTube channel, I called it the sourdough journey because I knew this would be a long road. So far to this point, we've been on a straight path. Today, we make the first turn. So today we're back to where we started, the Tartine Basic Country Loaf. Let's take a look at this. So in my experience over the last five months, what I found is that there are two common problems that I have when I try to make this recipe. As I said, I get consistently great results, but I don't get consistently spectacular results. The two things that happen is number one, my loaves are lacking in gluten development. So the gluten development is weak almost every time I make this recipe. And the second thing that occurs is the recipe has a tendency to underproof. So those are the two things that we'll try to remedy is gluten development and underproofing. So you can better understand what I'm getting at. Here's a picture of what a lot of my loaves look like. You can see that large irregular crumb in that up and down vertical position is really due to lack of gluten development. And then the dense crumb and the irregular open crumb and sometimes tunneling, sometimes this is called a fool's crumb, is because of under proofing. It just doesn't ferment fully. So these are the two things we're trying to remedy. Now contrast that with a few of my better loaves. Here's an example of a fully proofed wild crumb. And here's another example of a fully proofed loaf, good structure to the loaf, and that beautiful wild open crumb. This is what I'm seeking. So let's figure out how can we do it. So to understand why these issues may be occurring, I looked deeply into how Chad Robertson created this recipe and it started to make sense why this occurs. When Chad Robertson created the tartine bread recipe, he was essentially running a one man bakery operation for almost 10 years. He was working around the clock. So the method that he devised to, do, to make this bread is a labor saving method that was what he was focused on in terms of the process was, is there any way to take steps of labor out of the process, to take handling steps out of the process because he was doing everything himself. So that made perfect sense. So the way Chad Robertson made this recipe work with a limited hands-on approach that he was trying to achieve is he enlisted the help of two other parties. The first one was a flour supplier. So what Chad did to remedy the issue of low gluten development is he found the best flours. There's two ways to increase the gluten in your recipe. One is more handling to try to create gluten through the mechanical process of handling the dough. The second way is just bring more gluten to the party in the flour. So Chad sought out, I'm assuming, 
higher gluten flours that would, that would do more of the work in terms of gluten development right from the start by having higher protein and higher gluten content in the flour. So now if you look at uh, the Tartine Bakery website in San Francisco, Chad talks about how he's seeking out the best uh, grains for his flour. He has a flour producer in the Skagit Valley who's hand picking, hand milling the most perfect grain for the Tartine Bakery. I assume that Chad probably did this as he was developing the recipe as well. My flour supplier is King Arthur. He died in the sixth century and he sells his flour in supermarkets. I have to assume that Chad Robertson probably has better flour than I have. So that's the first thing that we're gonna look at is flour quality. The second party that Chad enlisted to help him make the bread is his starter. So Chad has a probably 20 year old San Francisco starter that he's using to make his bread. I have a six month old Cleveland starter. So I also have to assume I probably don't have as strong of a starter as Chad has. So I had pretty good success with King Arthur bread flour and other bread flours, but I've recently upgraded now to a higher gluten flour. So this is from the Central Milling Company in the US. This is called Organic High Mountain High Gluten Flour. This is 13.5% protein, which is a little high. We're gonna use this in today's recipes. Uh, I've had pretty good success with this. When I went from bread flour to using this higher gluten flour, the impact was immediately noticeable in the crumb of my loaf. So we're gonna go with that 13.5% protein higher gluten flour. So the higher gluten flour should help with our gluten development. Now let's look at the second issue, which is a weak starter. I've tried and tried to increase the strength of my starter. I've tried everything imaginable. I think it's okay, but I'm assuming it's still probably not as strong as Chad Robertson's San Francisco starter. My Cleveland special just isn't quite mature enough yet. So the only thing I can do here is let the dough ferment longer, which is a relatively easy problem to solve, but I just have to readjust in my mind how long is it gonna take versus the recipe to get the full development of the fermentation and the full proofing of the loaves. So we'll also experiment today with a little bit longer proofing than what the recipe calls for. So that covers the two easy ways to solve these problems. The third piece though is again back to the gluten development where even when you bring a higher gluten flour to the recipe, to your mix, the other part of gluten development is the handling. So that's really what we're gonna focus on today. We're gonna to bake three loaves, generally following the Tartine Basic Country Loaf recipe, and we're gonna focus on different types of handling across those three loaves to see how the higher gluten flour, longer proofing time, and different handling will work to potentially get us towards that spectacular loaf that we're looking for. So the three loaves that we'll be baking today are all based on the Tartine Basic Country Loaf recipe, and I call these three variations on a theme. We're basically gonna follow the recipe in general, but we're gonna make some minor modifications along the way, looking at the three loaves. Loaf number one, I'm gonna to try to channel my best Chad Robertson and follow this recipe by the book. I went back and reread it. I'm gonna to try to do it exactly as written and see what impact that has. That'll be our baseline loaf number one is the by the book recipe. Number two is a recipe where I'm going to add in some of the modifications that I've learned through my experiments over the last five months. So this is a slightly modified application of the tartine recipe. It's still following all the steps of the recipe, but it's leaning into the areas that develop gluten and the proofing. So this is what I'd say bending the rules of the recipe without really breaking the rules. That'll be number two loaf will be our bending the rules loaf. And then our third loaf will be really breaking the rules. This will be stepping outside of the exact steps in the process that are listed in the tartine recipe. And this is gonna be looking at what some other bakers have done. And there are three people who've really influenced the way that I'm looking at the tartine recipe now. So I'm going to do a hybrid of some of the application that these other bakers do when they bake tartine-like recipes. 
These three bakers basically do front end gluten development. So they do a long auto lease and a lot of hand mixing before they start uh, where the tartine recipe kicks off, where we have the starter, the water and flour. These other recipes have already developed a lot of gluten prior to that. And these three recipes are based on three bakers. That's Maurizio Leo, whose website, The Perfect Loaf, is a fantastic resource for sourdough bakers. Many of his recipes are based exactly off of the tartine recipe. He was very much influenced by that. The second source that I use is Trevor Wilson's Open Crumb Mastery. This is a phenomenal ebook, which I've printed. So now it's actually a book. Uh, that's a phenomenal resource for really understanding the mechanics and incredible amount of detail about how to get open crumb in a sourdough loaf. And the third influence in the hybrid loaf number three is Kristen Dennis from Foolproof Baking. She has some great instructional videos and her video has really popularized the method of coil folding rather than stretch and folds. So we're going to empl employ some coil folding in loaf number three. So here's the rundown of what we're going to do with the three loaves. Loaf number one, tartine, basic country loaf, by the book. I'm going to channel Chad Robertson as best as I can on that one. There are two modifications that have come out since the book was published. So I don't know if these were omissions or clarifications, but basically there are two things that have emerged since the publication of this book that I just want to clarify because I'll be adopting both of these changes uh, in, in the loaf number one by the book recipe. So I guess it's no longer technically by the book, uh, but it's by the book with the approved modifications from Tartine. One of these came out in book three, which revisits this recipe. The other one is from a New York Times publication of the recipe with, that's actually on the Tartine Bakery website. And those two changes are, there should be a 30 minute rest after you add the salt before you do the first stretch and fold. And then the second thing, which was always very ambiguous in the original book was how many stretch and folds should you do and how long should you do those in bulk fermentation. These other two versions of the recipe specify essentially six stretch and folds with 30 minute intervals. The book originally said you should do four with 30 minute intervals with the option to do more. I'm going to go with the six that's now recommended because that may have been contributing to the low gluten development in some of my recipes. So those are the by the book modifications loaf number one. Loaf number two, this is basically going to be my interpretation of tartine where I'm going to try to do a little bit more gluten development on the front end. So in terms of the hand mixing that you do when you add the salt and you, and you, you add the starter water and flour, I'm going to mix that a little bit more vigorously than what's called for in the book. Again, because I'm going to lean into the steps where I develop gluten. And then in the stretch and fold methods, I'm going to do a little bit more structural folding. I'll show you what that means when I get there. And then lastly, to combat the issue of underproofing, I'm going to proof these loaves a little bit longer, proof the dough a little bit longer, and proof the loaves a little bit longer based on how it looks at the end of bulk fermentation. But I think I'm going to go a little bit longer than what the book calls for. And then loaf number three, this is the break all the rules uh, based on uh, Maurizio Leo, Trevor Wilson, Kristen Dennis's uh, methods and approaches to tartine. In this one, we're gonna do very heavy front end mixing of the dough. So I've already mixed the dough. I'm doing a three hour auto lease of the dough with only water and flour. Then I'm gonna do a very aggressive mixing of the dough to try to bring out as much of the gluten development before we get into bulk fermentation. And then in bulk fermentation, we'll do a combination of stretch and folds and coil folds to do a little bit more of that structural folding to get the gluten development uh, working a little bit differently in loaf number three than what Chad calls for in loaf number one. In terms of the shaping, I'll cover the pre-shaping and final shaping when we get to that point, but I'm going to shape all these up into three batards. And depending how we do the pre-shaping and how we do the final shaping, really we're going to have to look at how the, the dough looks coming out of bulk fermentation. And then I'll explain why we're using different types of techniques in pre-shaping or final shaping. Those are the three loaves. Let's bake some bread.
So if you're not familiar with the Tartine Basic Country Loaf recipe, let me give you the quick rundown. You can watch my other videos for the complete, every step in this process is in my first five part series, Beginner Mistakes and Tips Using the Tartine Method. This is the very, very short version. I'm basically using the full two loaf recipe that's called for, it's a thousand grams of flour weight, but we're gonna divide it up into three loaves. So instead of two 500 gram flour weight loaves, we're gonna have three 333 and a third gram flour weight loaves. With that thousand grams of flour, it's a mix of 90% bread flour, 10% whole wheat flour. I'm using the central milling, high gluten flour for my bread flour and the King Arthur organic whole wheat flour for the whole wheat. To that, we're gonna add 200 grams of leaven, which I made the night before at a low temperature. This is considered a young leaven, which is one of the key aspects of the tartine recipe. You wanna read up on that if you're getting into tartine for the first time. We add the 200 grams of leaven, then we add 750 grams of water. There are specific water temperatures given in the recipe, generally between 78 and 80 degrees. Fahrenheit, which is about 25 to 26 degrees Celsius. The water temperature is very important to make this recipe work. And then lastly, we're gonna add 20 grams of salt for 2% salt relative to the flour weight. So basically using the baker's percentages, 1,000 grams of flour, 75% water, 2% salt, 20% leaven, when you include the water and flour ratio in the leaven, it takes it up to a 78% hydration recipe, which is starting to get reasonably high, but it's not super high hydration. It's a very nice recipe to work with. And when you have a high gluten flour that absorbs a little bit more of the water, this feels like a little bit lower hydration recipe based on the absorbency of your flour. That's a good point to consider when you talk about high hydration loaves and high hydration handling and beginners shouldn't try high hydration loaves. What I find is that high hydration is not really an absolute term. Uh, if I say I'm using a 75% hydration recipe or 78% in this case, it depends on the flour. If I use 78% hydration with really weak supermarket all purpose flour, that's gonna feel like an 85% hydration recipe. Or in this case, if I'm doing 78% hydration with a real absorbent flour, this feels like it's lower than 75% uh, hydration. So you can't look at high hydration alone. You have to look at hydration relative to your flour absorbency. And when people say beginners can't handle high hydration, what I would say is beginners don't typically use the type of flour that can handle high hydration. And that's what makes it difficult to handle. Now, as we proceed through the video, I'll be using this chart to indicate where we are in the process. So what you can see here is I have the three loaves in the three columns to the right, and then down the left-hand side of the chart, I have the steps starting with auto lease through the end of bulk rise. So as I go through each one of the steps in the process, you'll see this chart appear before that section. The yellow box indicates which row we're on, and then you can read across through each one of the steps in the row for each of the three loaves to see what we're doing in the process. Okay, we're actually gonna start with loaf number three because on loaf number three, I'm doing a true auto lease. And what I mean by this is it's only adding the water and flour. In the tartine recipe, what they call the auto lease step is actually a ferment lease because it also includes the leaven. But an auto lease of flour and water, you can let this sit for as long as you want to because it, it doesn't start fermenting because it doesn't have the starter mixed in yet or the leaven. So for example, Trevor Wilson sometimes does an eight hour auto lease. Kristen Dennis does a three hour auto lease. I've done about three and a half hours since I mixed this up this morning. This is basically flour and water. It's just sitting here at room temperature. And what's happening here is we're using the chemical reaction between the water and the flour to create gluten. So when we talk about how do we get gluten development in a recipe, this is step one, use chemistry. Just add water and flour, let it sit for a while, and you're gonna get some gluten development just by not handling it at all. I just did a very basic mix of this. So if I just pull a window pane here now, I haven't touched this, so I have pretty good gluten development there already 
by not even handling the dough, just by mixing the flour and water. So I'm letting the flour and the water do the work. So I'm utilizing a chemical reaction to create gluten, which gives me a head start. And then you might ask the question, why didn't Chad Robertson do an auto lease? I don't know the answer to that, but it's basically an extra step in the process. And if you're really focused on you know, labor saving, this is an extra step. It has to sit for three hours. It is easier just to add the flour, water, and leaven all at one time. But I've done the three hour auto lease for loaf number three. Okay, loaf number one, we're gonna mix up our ferment lease. So we're basically skipping the first possible step, which is auto lease. We could do an auto lease on this recipe, which is only mixing the flour and water. You let that sit for anywhere from 40 minutes. Some people do it overnight, eight hours or longer. And that basically conditions the flour and it starts to create gluten through the chemical reaction of adding water and flour. Chad Robertson chooses not to do this. It's an extra step in the process. So he goes, what he, what he calls auto lease is actually a fermenta lease because it includes the flour, the water, and the leaven. So all three of these go in at the same time. I think this is simply for convenience. Again, if you're trying to eliminate steps and reduce the amount of labor, you're going to skip unnecessary steps. Chad determined the auto lease to be unnecessary. He does it as a fermenta lease. So I have 333 grams of flour, one third of the recipe. So now I add 233 grams of water. This water is 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 26.7 degrees Celsius. Then I add 67 grams of leaven, which I made the night before. I usually dissolve the leaven in the water first. I actually did this backwards. I'll do it the other way on the next two loaves. I'm gonna mix this in by hand to make sure I get that leaven really distributed in here. I should have done this the opposite direction. So you just wanna mix this until it's into a shaggy ball. You don't really wanna overwork the dough at this point. So we're not trying to develop gluten right now. We're just trying to combine the ingredients. This is where tartine stops. So we're passing up the opportunity to do gluten development here. We passed up the opportunity to do gluten development through an auto lease of adding flour and water and letting it sit. We're just doing a basic shaggy mix of the water, flour, and leaven here to combine the ingredients. We're not doing a lot of development here. So we're not front loading any gluten development here when we have the opportunity. And that's just the way that Chad Robertson does this. And now the tartine recipe is very particular about maintaining the proper dough temperature throughout the process. So I'm gonna use a proofing chamber, which is my oven with the light on. I'm gonna put this in the proofing chamber. He says to let it sit for 30 to 40 minutes. Um, I'm gonna see how it looks after 30 minutes. So loaf number two, I combine the leaven and water. Add the flour, mix it in. Now, if I were following the recipe exactly, this is where I, it would say, mix it until all the flour is incorporated. There's no dry flour around the edges here and I have a shaggy ball that looks like a shaggy ball. If I were following the recipe by the book, I would stop right now, but I know that I have a tendency to underdevelop gluten. So I'm gonna take a little risk here and continue mixing this to try to create some additional gluten through the mixing process. So I just continue to work this. I'm still feeling some lumps of flour in here. So it's good to really work the dough and get those lumps out because they're not gonna come out later in the process so I'm gonna work this, continue to build some gluten for a couple more minutes. 
So I just mix that for about three minutes to develop some gluten. Uh, it's incredibly sticky, but that's a good sign because when you're developing gluten, the first three letters of gluten spell glue. It's actually derived from the Greek word for glue. Uh, that's evidence. I have gluten development right there. I can see it. So this felt like I was mixing this for a long time compared to what I typically do when I follow it by the book. When I stop, when I get to the shaggy ball stage, this is really a sticky ball now, but I know I have more gluten going into the process. So now Chad's dough is really relying exclusively on chemistry and biology to build the gluten. I'm using chemistry, biology, and physics. So you might ask the question, I get the chemistry part when you're adding water and flour in Chad's loaf. How does the biology play in? Just by adding the leaven, the leaven doesn't actually create gluten. It actually does. As soon as you add starter to the flour and water, the fermentation process starts and, it, and the yeast starts doing something called micro kneading. And what I mean by this is every time the yeast consumes starches and sugars and it gives off carbon dioxide, when it puffs out that gas of carbon dioxide, it's stretching the dough. It's actually creating gluten every time the yeast exhales. I know they don't exhale, but when they give off the carbon dioxide, they're stretching the dough. They're doing that millions of times. So the, the leaven actually does assist with the gluten development through the micro kneading process. That's how true hands off, no need recipes work, where you just mix the ingredients together and you never touch them. How else would the gluten be created? It's not just the chemical process. It's also that physical process that's being created by the biology of the yeast giving off the carbon dioxide and stretching the gluten strands a million, millions of times. So now the recipe says, let this sit for 30 to 40 minutes. If I know I have an issue with chronically underproofing, am I gonna let it sit for 30 minutes or 40 minutes? I gotta go for 40. So now I also have the option to let this sit on my countertop at room temperature, or I can put it into my proofing chamber. I have my oven with the light on, which usually sits at about 85 degrees Fahrenheit. So I have another decision to make. Do I leave it on the countertop or do I put it in the proofing chamber? If I'm trying to avoid underproofing, I put it in the proofing chamber. So I just made three seemingly small decisions here that impact the outcome of the loaf. I got to the point of the shaggy ball. I could have stopped. I kept going for three minutes. So I developed gluten for three minutes. I have the option to let this sit for 30 minutes or 40 minutes, still within the confines of the recipe. I choose 40 minutes instead of 30 because I have a tendency to underproof. And I have the option to let it sit on the countertop or put it into my proofing chamber. Again, it's got to go in the proofing chamber if I have a tendency to underproof. Those three small decisions make a huge difference and they compound with all the other small decisions that we make along the way. This is the multivariate analysis that I call alchemy. So now for loaf number three, we're gonna add the leaven. I made the leaven the night before using the tartine overnight method where you make this at a low temperature for a long period of time overnight. The leaven looks pretty good, smells pretty good. So now I'm just gonna fold this in by hand. You can see that dough is already setting up nicely just from the auto lease, it's amazing. See how it's pulling away from the sides. So when I try to decide how long should I be mixing this, Again, if I'm really focused on front loading the gluten development, this is where I want to build my gluten in this recipe. So I just keep going. So I mix that in for about three minutes. Now the dough is getting real stiff. I can feel it really pulling back against me. So I'm gonna let that go for now. So now we've caught up to where the tartine recipe would be with what tartine calls auto lease, which is really fermental lease. We've added the flour, water, and leaven. So we're gonna let this sit now for 40 minutes, just like we do with the others.